Good evening and welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome A. Natasha Joukowsky to our At Home with Literati series in support of The Portrait of Amir. She'll be joined in conversation this evening by writer Gia Tolentino. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be sharing links to purchase the Portrait of a Mirror from Literati throughout. You can also use the Q&A feature. It's on your toolbar to submit questions at any time, and I will ask a selection at the conclusion of the conversation tonight. Um, and as a reminder, you can also shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And of course, if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are now open to the public. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where and when in the world you may be joining us. And now allow me to introduce tonight's author and our moderator. A. Natasha Tchaikovsky holds a BA in English from the University of Virginia and an MBA from New York University's Stern School of Business. She spent five years in the art world working at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York before pivoting into management and consulting. She lives in Washington, DC. The Portrait of a Mirror is her debut novel. And Gia Tolentino is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Raised in Texas, she studied at the University of Virginia before serving in the Peace Corps and receiving her MFA in fiction right down the road from me at the University of Michigan. She was a contributing editor at The Hairpin and the deputy editor at Jezebel, and her work has appeared in The New York Times Magazine, Grantland, Pitchfork, and other publications. She lives in Brooklyn. Please join me in welcoming Gia Tolentino and A. Natasha Joukowsky into your living rooms. Hi, John. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Gia. Hi. This is this is such a this is such a special night because John is my dear friend from grad school. Natasha is my dear friend from like minute one of UVA, basically. Um, and I'm so excited to be here to talk to Natasha about her incredibly sharp and funny and addictively pleasurable debut novel. I think The Portrait of the Mirror is the most densely witty thing I've read in a really long time. It's a exact sort of book. It's just a total thrill to lose yourself in. And I've been really looking forward to being back in New York and seeing people read on the subway. And I really am so excited to see your book cover, you know, just walking through a car. And I promise to you know, accost these people and take selfies with them every time. Uh, and yeah, Natasha is a dear friend of mine going back what is now sort of a nauseating amount of time. It's like been blowing my, like it's wild how the people you've been close to since college are now people you've been close to for half your life. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and I have known she is this brilliant since, you know, I guess 2006, which is the year that I essentially pledged not just a sorority, but a debating society exclusively so I could hang out with her more. <laughs> um, but before I will stop, I will stop effusing. And before we start with questions, um, I think Natasha is going to read a little bit from chapter three of the book. Yes. So the scene I'm going to read uh, is in chapter three, like Gia said, one of the main characters, Wes, who is the CEO of a tech startup, has gone to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a tour, and he's late. Um, it, the tour was set up by uh, his chief operating officer at their startup, Echo. And um, at, it, in, in this scene there, the curator is in the middle of talking about this painting that's right here conveniently on the cover. Okay. But don't let Caravaggio's pretty surfaces fool you, said the curator. At its depth, this is perhaps his most violent painting. Narcissus is caught here between pleasure and pain, desire and anguish. We have to remember that at the end of Ovid's tale, Narcissus begs the gods for death. He pleads to be forcibly released from the image he loves too much to voluntarily escape. By painting Narcissus, Caravaggio indefinitely prolongs this tension and pain, denying him transformation, capturing him at the pivotal moment he is captured by himself, as he looks in wonder, charmed by himself, spellbound, and no more moving than any marble statue. 
Those are the words Ovid uses, no more moving than any marble statue. Medusa might make you afraid to turn around, but Narcissus, when you think about it, is the more frightening image. Here, the fear is in not turning around, and not, by the way, because you literally can't, but because you don't want to, because you don't want to, to the point that you're willing to accept any and all consequences of continuing to look. Caravaggio wanted this painting to be as seductively beautiful to you as the pool is to Narcissus. And the painting is as far beyond your reach as the viewer as the image in the pool is for Narcissus within it. It's really rather cruel. Caravaggio is again, as he did with his Medusa, trying to turn us into stone, into sculptures, into art. He's again asking us to question our reality in favor of his, to override our self-interest, if not our very humanity. He wants us to fall in to our detriment, but this time he's asking us to ask for it. It's a power move in a painting. I'll stop there. No, keep going. <laughs> keep going? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it felt too, I mean, I don't know. You feel so long when you're doing this. You're no, like, no, you, you don't have to. I I, I also over Zoom. I, I, when I am in the reading position, I also feel like everything's I, too long. I, I'll be honest. I planned on reading another page and a half, but it feels so long when you're doing I think. It. I think you should. Okay. Keep going. All right, I will. <laughs> you paused, letting that one sink in. There were appreciative ahs and chuckles. Wes kind of wished he hadn't missed the first half of the tour. But there's someone here I haven't even mentioned yet. Someone I believe this group in particular will have a special affinity with. Yes, that's right, Echo. The pretty nymph who could only repeat the last thing said to her, who fell hopelessly in love with Narcissus and bore his callous rejection. Now, before you say, wait a minute, I don't see a pretty nymph anywhere in this painting. Let's go back to Ovid. When he describes Echo's metamorphosis, Ovid says that she frets and pines, becomes all gaunt and haggard. Her body dries and shrivels till vo voice only and bones remain. And then she is voice only for the bones are turned to stone. The curator paused. For the bones are turned to stone, she reiterated. So where is Echo in the paint? She's us, interrupted Joel Francis. We're the Echo and we are Echo. He smiled like a maniac. Julian inhaled deeply, wide-eyed with embarrassment. He looked at Wes as if he expected him to do something. Right, that's right, the curator replied with a laugh, not seeming to mind in the slightest, if anything delighted by Joel's enthusiasm. And that echo is itself an echo too, an echo of Narcissus, no more moving than any marble statue, an echo of Ovid's words in paint, an echo of Caravaggio's own Medusa painted two years earlier. And today, as you say, an echo of echo with two Cs. There are echoes and echoes, echoes all over the place. It can get rather confusing actually, although today I realize I'm lecturing to a group of experts on the subject. So I'm sure you all will be able to keep them straighter than I. Yeah, but even the highest IQ human brains can only process like six, maybe seven levels of recursion before meaning is rendered unstable, Joel Francis explained, trying to humbly offset the compliment and failing in a tone that suggested he felt he'd already developed a deep personal rapport with the curator of the, over the course of the tour. Julian seemed to be frantically searching for a prefrontal cortical fire extinguisher. Wes squeezed his shoulder firmly, reassuring him it was all right. The curator herself seemed unfazed by the interruption. Well, you may need all of those levels today because I have another one for you. If you haven't already fallen too deeply into the painting, would you please turn around? And there I really will stop. <laughs> Um, I, it's, it's kind of amazing. I, I didn't realize like how amazing that this painting gets to be on the cover. Like, thank God for the public domain, right? Like incredible. Yeah. Uh, Although yeah. one of the, one of the like images in the final copy that, um, cause there's like an image appendix in the final yeah. version. Oh, well, cool. Those, I did have to pay a hundred dollars to license. Oh, <laughs> you know what? It. A bargain. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, okay, I want to just start by, like, I find it, like, both, like, infuriating and also just, like, th this is your first, this book is the first time you have written fiction, which is astonishing. It is astonishing. And I, and I remember the first time, you know, I remember, like, we met up at some bar and you, you told me you were working on a novel and I was like, oh, yeah, that'll be great. And then I read it and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, like, I knew it would be, I knew it would be fantastic, but this it's so, your voice is so fully formed and you're, and I wanted to talk to you about how you started this project, how you started writing fiction in general, when, you know, your day jobs have been far outside the realm of fiction writing, not that anyone gets to write fiction for their day job, we all wish, but um, yeah, tell me about, 
making this first foray into the novel, where you were, what you were, and at what point you started to feel like this is going to be a book? Well, I spent over a year just like figuring out the voice, like yeah. writing random paragraphs, like really, I mean, maybe kind of thinking that I was trying, but I was really, what in retrospect, what I was really doing was trying to find the narrative tone. And it really did take that long. And I probably, you know, I, I didn't even write that much, right? It was mostly staring at a blank computer screen and thinking about it and reading the same four sentences that I'd written over and over and over. Say but more that, about establishing that voice though, because it's, it's, it is, it's so fine tuned, right? It's like, what were you, what were the sort of poles that you were moving between? What was the, what did you know you wanted in the book? Well, I think that this is one of the benefits of not having any formal fiction writing education, because obviously I've had a lot of, um, you know, literary education in general, but not specific to fiction writing, um, that I was, I was looking at books for guidance that are very out of fashion right now. So when I went to develop the narrative voice, I was looking for something between Austin and Joyce yeah. and nobody was there to tell me like, you're aiming too high. <laughs> so, right. I'm like, I wrote my thesis on Joyce at UVA. My father started reading me Jane Austen's novels when I was 10 and she's yeah. like the voice that narrates my conscience still. Yeah. And and I, I wanted I wanted to 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 split, you know, to to split the difference between them, to create something that would be like uber intellectual and elusive if you got it. But unlike Joyce, that would actually be quite accessible and, you know, smoothed over so that the references would all be so um, like deeply and superficially um worked into the voice and narrative that if you didn't get something, you wouldn't notice that there was something to get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you spent, and when you spent a year working out the voice and did you know, like, so there, the, the plot of the novel, like it hinges on a, you know, this, this very particular kind of very neat structural mechanism of, I, I don't know if we want to spoil it. I, I think that, I think that we can, we can spoil part of it that it's yeah. that it's two couples that, that, that fall you know, in love with each other <laughs> that fall in love with each other and they make yeah. different decisions and I think yeah. we, what we what we shouldn't spoil is what the decisions are that they yeah. make but I think that the you know the the structure is by the way you know very uh, you know well trodden territory I should say in literature like um, I borrowed a lot uh, the the idea of the plot a lot of that came from David Lodge's wonderful campus novel changing places again my characters make different different decisions so it's a little bit different but the idea of like spouse swapping and you know the tone too right like david lodge is very you know witty very you know dialogue you know quippy dialogue oriented and super inspired by the western canon so um lodge was a huge a huge huge influence on this book yeah, it's funny, like I always used to think when I was writing a lot more on the internet, I would always think the piece that you should write is the piece that you wanna read. And, it, and, and sort of, it sounds like that was your instinct. It was like you were craving a kind of novel that is not incredibly common. I mean, I think that like the voice to me, it's, I was remembering there was a, like, I know you've gotten some Gossip Girl comparisons, which I think is an incredibly high compliment. Oh, because I love are, Gossip Girl. I will take the Gossip thin. Girl compliments all day. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and I was remembering, like, I don't know, Janet Malcolm reviewed the book, those books for The New Yorker once. And yeah. it was incredible because it was like, you know, the books, there is, there is so much frivolity to it. There's so much kind of overt su superficiality to it. But the books are actually, you know, they, they, the books were better than anyone they were more literarily interesting than anyone except for Janet Malcolm and, you know, maybe you and me and maybe people in here gave it credit for, but it was like the, the voice, it's this, this sort of kind of observational sharpness that, you know, yeah, you associate with Austin or like the sort of, and then there's the, that like kind of arch narrative distance that you associate with like an Edith Wharton or Henry James, but then, and, you know, and even stylistically you use dashes rather than quotation marks, but mm -hmm. then, you know, this is also like an ultra contemporary novel. The reference points mm -hmm. are very contemporary. It's sort of juicy and gossipy and like it goes straight for the texture 
of like a certain slice of life at a certain time. You know, the, the characters get into a really long argument about cereal at some point, you know, like at some bar in the West Village or whatever it is. Yep, yeah. Like, that was, that was really drawn from life, honestly. The yeah. conversation <laughs> was deeply drawn from life. I mean, no one could shut up about that. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and you know, there are like emails, text messages, Wikipedia pages play a big role in the same way that I guess like epistolary episodes would in, and, and I guess, so tell me more about, so you, you said Austin, Joyce, who else? What were Lodge? What were the other books that you well, were? Well, um, Wharton, James, I mean, they, yeah. they I actually read later because yeah. of after, you know, you know, sending the book to a few agents that, you know, you were kind enough to put me in touch with and getting feedback and, you know, Hey, this is, you know, reminiscent of some old people. You're like, Oh shit. I got to read. I got to read. I got it. I got it. Yeah, go yeah, yeah. And then when I read the portrait of a lady, I, it was, um, it, it was alarming in my, in my mind. I felt like I had arrived at something so similar, um, from a tonal perspective as, he does in that novel. I know he like experiments much more later, but in, in that novel specifically, I, I, it felt like I was reading something that I'd written a hundred years ago and it was almost, you know, almost eerie. And I, you know, I loved it so much and was, you know, of course, then I had to work some lines from that novel into portrait. So there are a few, are there a few Easter eggs from that one? It, and that, it, that also inspired big, big time inspired the title, which was originally recursion, which my husband thinks was a horrible title because it's not a book about aliens. And when Blake Crouch's novel came out, he says it's the best thing that ever happened to me to change it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like that. I liked that title, but you're right that like that title definitely gives me more like that's I'm, I'm th I immediately think like it's some sort of Jeff Vandermeer, like Kim Stanley Robinson type right. high concept, like something. Right. And, and yeah, and, and, and like the this cover wouldn't have made as much sense. with No, that. no, no. You know. no. Um, and yeah, there's. Jeez. Okay, so there are these like aphoristic touchstones that, you know, often begin chapters in the sort of traditional you know, the sort of like 19th Elliot century. too, I should say. Oh yeah. George Elliot. Big, I mean, the several of the lines. Of all of and I, I actually, again, my editor between the arc and the final copy had me add a third appendix with all of the anxieties of influence. Oh yeah. So Great. There's lists of novels and novellas, the poetry, the philosophy, nonfiction, humor, essays, and criticism. What but, poetry is in there? What? What poetry is in there? Uh, Virgil's Aeneid, Herrick's Delight and Disorder, Dante's Divine Comedy. Classicist. <laughs> what? Yeah, for You're sure. Classicist for through sure. and through, girl. <laughs> Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, you know, Ode on a like the best ever college Morris, class on together. Milton. <laughs> the Phoenix and the Turtle, which I believe we were in that class together. Yeah. When um, our professor like deep dived into the that poem, which is quoted at great length in the novel. Yeah, I was always really stoned in that class and I was always just like, wow. Like that was one of the, that was, that was a great class. Um, but so yeah, there's like the book begins with the, the line, there's no greater compliment in the world than being the uncooperative catalyst of another person's misery. And then another chapter begins of all the dangers in life, there's perhaps none more treacherous than getting precisely what you want. Mm -hmm. Do you, like, are you a notebook keeper? Do you, like had these aphorisms, you know, had had these been floating around in your head, do you just have a notebook somewhere full, full of these? <laughs> well, now it's Scrivener. Oh but yeah, Scrivener. Yeah, pre Scrivener. It was all because um, I converted to Scrivener like halfway through writing. Yes, um, yes. But pre Scrivener, it was uh, text the notes app on my phone, and yes, oh. I would just kind of write jot jot these down. Um, you know randomly they wouldn't they, those wouldn't even though I composed it very very linearly um you know things would come to me and I'd and I'd write it down and then I'd figure out you know like a like a, a it's almost like a rubrics cube putting it together then right um but yeah so I, that's where I would would store them and they'd you know sometimes they'd come fully formed sometimes they'd you know need a little workshopping but I think you know I'm very inspired by the like 
big first sentence. It is yeah. a truth universally acknowledged state right. like Buck Mulligan, all happy families are alike, right? Like right. these are the books that I was looking at. I, and, you know, I didn't really start reading contemporary fiction for better or for worse yeah. until um, after I sold the book. That's so funny. I don't think I could have, I mean, I, I just, I, I did not realize also the extent to which the novel I was writing was out of style. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think I wouldn't say I was thinking what else like I think about Min Jin Lee's Pachinko. It's another novel that is, you know, it is like a Dickens type. I mean, it is like mm -hmm. this this dense middle March type this like the intense pleasures of like social 19th century yeah. realism. And it is, you know, but but it's set in set in Korea, you know, through this time span. I mean, there's there is something like many of the novels, the contemporary novels that I have loved the most. And Pachinko is like forefront among them. It's like a novel that I can't stop record. You know, I've always, like whenever someone's going on a trip. I need to read it. It's, oh, it's high on my list. It's so, so good. And it's because, you know, I mean, I think you will like it for this reason. I mean, it feels, it has these sort of old fashioned bones in some way, but it's, it's because of the setting, it feels like unbelievably fresh. And there are, there are pleasures of the kind of, these novels that are self-conscious in a different way than literature is self-conscious now. Like, did you start reading contemporary fiction? You were like, this, this sucks. <laughs> no, well, actually the first thing, the first book of contemporary fiction I read was when you told me like, you have to read the love affairs of Nathaniel P. And I, oh, yeah, I knew you would love that book. Yeah. Cause that's the other one that like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. waited until I'd broken the back of the novel, like until I was more than halfway done because I was worried that it would influence me too much. But once I was like, I think like I was two thirds of the way through, I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing for the rest of it. It's not going to change yeah. what I'm doing. And then I read it. I loved, I really loved it. I thought yeah. it was a wonderful novel and, you know, it was, was used for a comp, you know, by my publisher totally. for this book, et cetera. What about, the book is also really funny, which I think is a really, it's a feat. I mean, there are very few, um, you know, I, I, I can't really name, I, like funny fiction is, I really can't name that many books that make me, that have actually made me laugh out loud. Like I think of, like, a, like an Alyssa Nutting's Made for Love made me laugh a lot. Have you read yeah. Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson? No. It's hysterical. Okay, great. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, are there, are there comic writers that you admire in particular? Because I think it's it's really hard to do. Um, I mean, for me, the comic writing, and this is the this is what I actually thought that I would have, you know, written my first book um, like is is David Sedaris. I love David Sedaris. I have loved him since I was a teenager. Idolized him like tried very hard to emulate him in things that have never quite worked. What do you mean? <laughs> and I mean, like, you know, I, I, I've tried, you know, to write humorous essays that I've, that I've, you know, never really shown to anybody because they don't meet my standards. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but just like, I just like, you know, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're influenced by one person too much, I think it doesn't work. And yeah. for me with, you know, writing, you know, humorous personal essays, I just want to be David Sedaris and David Sedaris is already David Sedaris. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> but, but with, with, with this book and, you know, with fiction, I think part of the reason that I stuck with it and it worked is it was a novel where like Joyce or like Elliot, I was stealing a little bit from everybody. And when you steal a little bit from everybody, it's not plagiarism, it's synthesis, right? And yeah. <laughs> and and it's super, super inspirational. And and you know, stealing, if you steal the the best line from everybody, you're gonna get some really good stuff. Yeah. So it's really funny. I was it was really, really funny though when um when we were editing the book, uh one line my editor was like, Do we really need this? And like, it's from Moby Dick. <laughs> Wait, which line? Um, it was in the. Is I've in never the, read Moby Dick. Around Nantucket, like huh. um, Nantucket, like Nantucket, take out Google Maps and look at it. Like that whole paragraph is pulled and modernized, you know, straight from Moby Dick. Like yeah. it, that that paragraph in, in Melville's novel is like, take out your map and look at. It. And I changed. That's so funny. Take out Google Maps and look at it. <laughs>
God, I got to read Moby Dick. I like, that was like one of those pandemic things that I was like, maybe I'll finally read Moby Dick, but I didn't. Um, so, okay. So we are both sort of conceptually interested in mirror as a sort of overarching metaphor. Yes. For, <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> I know, but it's like, but you know, also it, it doesn't not make sense. It's like, and also it's like, as a, it's an extremely apt, like, structure for examining personal failure and desire also social failure and social desire and um and sort of like i don't know i mean it is it is like absolutely true that many of the structures and incentives that comprise the texture of everyday living are you know they're they're set up to make the world just reflect yourself back to you in the most flattering way possible and you know and, and there's there's something to and it's it's it, it becomes very clear within the plot of the novel. Like so, there are these two married or married or soon to be married. There are these two couples, and they are like crossing their crossing their lines, falling in love with the other person. And you know, but of course, what they're really falling in love with is a different version of themselves. And so, just tell me tell me about that as sort of like how how that is the guiding structure for you know. The, the plot of the book, also just the metaphor, metaphorical structure for, I don't know, partnership or just attachment, you know, was that central all along this? Yeah, this sort yeah. Of, I mean, I really you know, started yeah. with the narcissist myth, which, which has, you know, mirrors all over it and is so central to that foundational story, right? And I, I think what's always fascinated me by Ovid's telling of the myth of Narcissus specifically, and that's actually why I read this passage um, from chapter three, is its recursive nature. And um, you know, you you have I think you know written about this too with with self, you know, the way the the self improvement cycle and um, you know and and the, the ways the internet is you know recursive and, and building on itself and and the way everything is you know self referential in our world. So I think that in that way, the myth of narcissists and mirrors are just such a natural corollary to our world right now, where we're still figuring out how to use the internet and social media and these, you know, tools are, are, are acting as mirrors too, right? Um, like there's a part in the novel where Vivian, one of the main characters looks in her phone and like feels like her life is trapped behind the glass. And like these, these things are like extensions of us. They're like Stygian pools in our pockets. And um, it's, it's, it, it just, it, it went too perfectly um, in terms of tying the timeless and the temporal, yeah. um, going back to Elliot and tradition, you know, what I was trying to do ultimately was like write a novel that Elliot would have approved of in tradition and the individual talent that, you know, a novel that is for 50, a hundred years, you know, even if it's out of style now, right? And um, and and the the mirror piece is I, I think really a, a, a temporal timeless um, trope given, you know, that we're, we're all human beings. It's, you know, right. Th that self, that, that self, del self delusion, you know, to go from your, your uh, subtitle is so central to human beings throughout time, but then also like, particularly at this moment, um, it's, it's core to what we're all seeing and being driven by. Yeah. It's been funny to me has, so your your son does he recognize himself in mirrors? Does oh he, yeah, I mean he like makes out with himself in the mirror. Yeah, but but there but you know there's like this period like like Coloma loves herself. My baby loves her loves to look at herself in the mirror, but she I can tell she doesn't know it's her yet. You know what I mean? Oh she no, he knows it's him. He knows. It's like him. At, at what point did that? Because like I was like, oh god, when is the Lacanian like, like thing kick in? Months. Okay, like, okay, good. So I've got a while because I'm loving months. You have some time. You have some time, but then yeah. like they're like mesmerized yeah. <laughs> it is, this is deep in our nature and absolutely I, it gets to the fact that babies that our children can already see this like paloma's what like six eight nine, nine months nine yeah. months yeah oh gosh and dorian's two and a half and like the fact that they can already see it one of the things that i was super super interested in with this and you know in narcissists in general is the depth of superficiality like we you know there's always 
there's we're we're often inclined to be like, oh, selfies so superficial. But the reason that these technologies and selfies and everything have like grasped us so so fundamentally and we're so addicted to them is because they are rooting into like some deep shit. Like yeah. the the like very, very fundamental um desires and requirements of 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 our egos and um and and you know and and you know they're like self-preservation mechanisms like right the they they almost fulfill the requirements that narcissus lacked like they allow for permanence for you know that that always fleeting image of narcissus we can now make right. permanent and right we can, you know, share it with everyone and, and get feedback. So I, I think that it's that, you know, we're, we're quick to, to judge, but these things are, these things are powerful. Well, and, and that sort of extends to the style that you adopt throughout the book where it's like, where, where it is like, you know, there's, there's one level on, on which like, there's like a, a like a close narration of ostensibly superficial decisions that are actually cutting like deep to the yeah. to the to the to, to needs and in, in the psyche and yeah it's it has it has deeply disturbed me I will say that like the first object that Paloma realized was interesting was obviously obviously the phone and there was like a couple of months you know maybe four to six months where she would you know be in a bad mood and the thing the thing that would cheer her up most, the only thing that would cheer up is showing her pictures of herself when she was happy. And I was like, holy fuck, like a me in quarantine, just looking at old pictures of myself having fun and like, you know, like, yeah. like yeah. you know, and it was just, it, it is, it is, it is more primal and pre-verbal and instinctive than I have understood. Like it, it has been shocking to see exactly what you're talking about, the level at which it's like, it's this like neural, compulsion that is active in a being that you know knows literally nothing and constantly <laughs> ships itself you know what I mean like yeah yeah <laughs> no I mean you just wait for it Dorian now runs around saying like 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 he wants to open tiny beans he's like want to look at pictures of Dorian <laughs> yeah yeah but that's it's like that. literally like that's literally us interacting with our world I mean that that is what the characters in this novel are doing they're essentially walking around their world and saying like show me pictures of myself and if the pictures are unsatisfactory they start making more interesting decisions which is you know <laughs> and I guess that's how life works exactly, right like <laughs> exactly and this I mean it's also this 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 concept of I think it exacerbates something that existed previously, which is this idea of interpersonal recursion that, you know, you're thinking when I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about what you're thinking about what I'm saying. I'm thinking about, you know, how I should react to what you're thinking. That, uh -huh. you know, and it goes, you know, it goes back and forth to the point of absurdity. I think of the scene in, um, in The Princess Bride where they're going back and forth across the table um, uh, the, the, um, what's his name? The man in black and the, and Wallace Shawn's character. Yeah. And, you know, they're trying to psychoanalyze each other. You know, you would say that I would think that you would yeah, say yeah, that, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that we're all kind of doing that all the time. And the technology I think makes it worse, but it predates it. Right. I, this is, sorry, just back to something you were saying earlier, you were saying that you loved Ovid's telling of the Narcissus myth in particular because it is particularly recursive. Yeah. And I'm just, I was like gonna text you about it after, so I was like, well, I'll just fucking ask you about it now. What is, what is, is there something specific about the Ovid? Like, I genuinely don't know. Is there something specific about that telling that is especially, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's the way he, he mentions all the different forms of art, right? So like, like Narcissus is always turning to marble. So you're, you're getting um, a lot of recursion through art where, um, you know, a person is likened to art and then the art is, is, you know, reflected and becomes another art. And then that, you know, that image comes back. So you, between the, you know, the mirrors and, um, and the, you know, all of the different media that he, 
um, represents and weaves together. Um, also the, like the way Ovid's narration um, has stories within stories within stories, like the right. story of Narcissus is, you know, told by Tiresias and the story of Tiresias, you, you, you get that, you know, recursive halo in, you know, the structure of his work. I think, you know, you get it, it shows up in the, you know, in the Narcissus, or in the, in the Medusa myth a lot as well um, with, with, you know, again, the idea of the shield as a mirror and, you know, art becoming reality, becoming art, becoming, right. you know, so I, 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 I think it, it shows up in a, in a bunch of different places. He's, uh, as, as our friend Paul Borolsky would say, he's exquisitely self-reflexive. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I feel like maybe I, I, that, that class, I remember actually that class was specifically very formative on my writing in terms of it got, it got it like in one note, he really ably, this like amazing professor we had, he got rid of like the worst thing that was in my writing for so long, or, you know, maybe it still is, but. What, what was it? Well, I, it was like some, in the final thing we turned in, he was just like, he just, he was like, this is fine, but you could take all of the weight out of it. He was like, just write it and pitch it. He was like, try to try to take the weight out. And that was such a good note. Like I was, I, I think during college, I was constantly, you know, you like kind of purple and like everything had to be the most important thing of all time. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, it's not that deep. You can just, you can, you can, you can ride a little lighter. And yeah. that was a really, that was a really formal. Like I, I've completely forgotten about that note till you, it's, um, well, because yeah. he's the master of like erudite lightness, yeah, which is exactly what I was going for yeah. in the like in the tone of this, like that that tonal. In terms of where that tone came from, it it came from from that class classes, I should say, with and Borolsky. Like the part that I that I read from chapter three, like the art parts of that were from a paper that I wrote for him. Literally, like you know, I definitely edited it and changed things, but like. Most of the ideas about art in this book came from classes with him. What, to what extent was that? So you, you know, you worked, you worked at the Met for how many years? Uh, I worked at the Met for three years. I was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art for two years before that. So I was in the art world for five years as a whole. And, and you, it's, and so there is a significant amount of that in this. There's also, there's also management consulting. Was I imagine that it was a lot of fun to take this sort of storage bank of kind of interpersonal yeah. minutia and kind of absurdity and minor conflict that you know yeah. build up when you spend you know years and years in this sort of like a rarefied and in many ways sealed little worlds mm -hmm. of like specific mm -hmm. institutions or specific teams. Mm -hmm. um, and how'd you like, yeah, tell me about like, I don't know. I mean, I guess you knew when you were conceiving of the book that you would have like kind of this wealth of kind of very specific you know, social friction or, you know, kind of hierarchical friction to draw from. Um, yeah. Had you been taking, had you been keeping notes the whole time? Yeah. Or oh yeah. I mean, I was, I was taking notes on. Are you, do you always just, are you a voluminous journaler? I, I, it's more that I, I'm, I'm, I don't journal after the fact. I like, don't care what other people think. I pull, yeah. I whip out my phone and like, yeah down so in a moment when so you're it, like a re yeah you're like this anthropological reporter impulse yeah kind of I guess although, yeah. I, although that I mean I I don't think of it that way because it doesn't feel like work right it just feels like a specific form of observation of whatever's are yeah, totally happening right um but it's not, it's not like even going to seek it out necessarily always um the best example of this though isn't even from consulting or the museum, the best example of this is the character of Julian Pappas Fiducia, who, unlike all the other four characters who are basically me with composites of, you know, people I know and the, you know, just the milieu that I have frequented, um, the character of Julian is like extremely specifically based on my late friend, Evan. I, you know, I was trying to, you know, is like a tribute to him, right? To capture him in fiction. He knew I was doing it. I would pull out my phone all the time when I was with him to capture whatever um, he was saying. Many, I shouldn't say 
at least several of the most outrageous lines in the novel are his, not mine. I, yeah, I have to say, like, not to slight the other ones, he's definitely the best character. He's amazing. <laughs> and... <laughs> I mean, I think that personally, I think that it's always the most outrageous people in real life that you like cannot believe are real people that make the most believable, most wonderful characters. I think of, this is where I think of Anna Karenina and like Anna, which was a pure figment of Tolstoy's imagination versus Levin, who right. like, based on life and Kitty, who he based on his wife. And they're like, they are the most boring. Like Levin movies, is the, I, I haven't know. read that book. Levin is like where you get into all the farming stuff, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I can't. I can't with the farming. The farming felt like the farming philosophy we get into at the end. Like, I can't, I, I can't deal with the farming. It's like Although the I'm like. Sections of War and Peace. I skip them. I just. Oh, I love the War sections of War and Peace, but I don't like the farm sections of Anchorman. Exactly. 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 Um, I mean, it's one of them. Like, all of it. The, the only the only real people that make really good fictional characters are the people that you can't believe. John's back. I was just going to say John is going to come back soon and people more people should put questions in the chat. Um, but do you. We, can, we, ha we have we have some questions so we can we can get rolling with those. I, I well, one is just what's up. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I think we've talked about what's up a bit. Um, there is a question from Hannah um, to start us off, um, who writes, I'm such a fan of both of your books, G and Natasha. Um, uh, I'm curious, given the shared themes of narcissism, self-reflection and self-delusion in The Portrait of a Mirror and Trick Mirror, Gia's essay collection, how much has your friendship influenced your respective works? I.e. to Natasha, how has your friendship with Gia influenced the way you write and your subject matter and vice versa? Yeah, I think there's, this is, this is a great question. This is a really funny question. <laughs> yeah, I love this question. I think there's two confounding factors. I think number one is that Gia and I had a very similar education at a very crucial time of intellectual development being college that we, I mean, I want to say we had like 80% of our classes together. Like we, yeah. we did a lot of the same stuff. So I think we were both often react, we're often reacting at that, you know, in those years to similar stimuli, but then also, I mean, I've been inspired by Gia since the day she met, I met her. Like, I mean, Gia is, she will, you know, deflect and talk about weed and stuff. Gia <laughs> is an actual genius. Like, no, no, no. We all know people. She is one of the absolute smartest people I've ever met. And I've been in awe, in literal awe of her brain since forever. So I'm interested in, you know, things she's interested in because she's interested in them. That is, yeah, well... Okay, anyway, <laughs> I mean, I feel the same way about you, Natasha. And also, but it's it's funny, like this question, like given the shared themes of narcissism, self-reflection and self-delusion, it's like, perhaps the quickest answer to this is that we're probably both narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like, I think Natasha and I are very, are both extremely attuned for any number of reasons being like a conventionally socialized and ultimately quite conventional like woman you know who has you know like both of us are deeply attuned to social performance mm -hmm. at a deep personal level you know <laughs> and um i think both of us are accustomed it, it's interesting like i mean i hadn't thought about this connection but this question really clarifies it like for example both of us like I'm somewhat ashamed, you know, we were in, we were in a sorority in college and, and, you know, I think both of us have a way of living in the world that is like inhabiting something fully, but also running a parallel monologue about it. This, and so, 100%, that's so and, and that is like central to your fiction. And I think it is mm -hmm. central to the way, but yeah, the, the real thing, it's funny. Like I, my interests are much like, Natasha has been talking a lot about, you know, canonical stuff and classical stuff. And I actually would not have gravitated. I would, I would not, that's not where I gravitate intellectually, but I feel really glad that being in a particular place at a particular time made me absorb a lot of it. Um, and it's like just by blind luck, you know? Um, yeah. So 
it. I, I think the two the two levels thing is really big. Being able to make fun of something and also be a part of it, and also like unfortunately be a full enthusiastic participant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but you know, sometimes like passing notes about how dumb something is at the same time, even yeah. while you're like you know singing louder than anyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nick uh, writes in, in addition to all the arts literary nuggets, there are also so many satisfying pop culture zeitgeisty references throughout the portrait of Amir, from Taylor Swift to Taco Bell to Shaggy to the 1994 Little Women adaptation and more. Are there any in particular that were the most fun for you, Natasha, to incorporate into the narrative while writing? Oh, I love the 1994 Little Women. Oh my God, that that is maybe my favorite movie ever. Like I like it more than the book. I'm just going to say it like wow. the writer is Joe. Like I, yeah. whenever I was, um, you know, depressed at boarding school, I would go to my room and watch it by myself and like cry. Not when Beth dies, but when um, Joe cuts her hair. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that, so I loved writing, um, the, you know, the scene about, about like the different characters arguing over which, you know, which one of them is which little woman. Who are you, Natasha? You know, I, 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 I think you have, I have to say Joe, right? But I like, I think that, I think that like, um I think like Grace Cho says in the book, like I've always wanted to be Joe, but I'm really an Amy. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly how I am too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, we're splitting the difference maybe, but I, I'm not going to deny my, no, yeah. I'm not going to deny my yeah. Amy. Yeah. <laughs> we've both, we've both gone blonde. So there's yeah, that. we both fucking went blonde. We're, yeah. <laughs> um, a viewer in the UK um, writes, um, good evening to you both. Gia, I loved your book and reread it for the third time this month. Oh. And Natasha, I can't wait to read yours once it's released in July in the UK. I have two questions, I, I suppose, for both of you. The first, and I'm being completely earnest here, what is the value of doing an English literature degree? Asking as someone who is halfway through said degree and lives in constant fear of never landing a decent job. The second, uh, how can one be a good writer and human in the hellish age of the internet and late capitalism? Thank you. Great question. Uh, the first question seems doable. The second one seems impossible. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll answer this one first while you think about your answer to the second question, because I've had to answer the second question a lot and I obviously don't have an answer, but also thank you for reading my book, my friend. Um, I, you know, the value of doing an English literature degree, you, like it's, it really is about, I mean, I, I'm really glad I, we we both actually, yeah, we had the exact same major structure, me and Natasha. And like, I didn't think about the value of it in terms of like, what you will learn is, is objectively devalued in the world of capitalism. There is like, so David Graeber, right? The like anthropo late anthropologist, he writes that the, the more social utility a job has in the world, the less likely you, like the less you are likely to be paid for it. And I think that that's, true and I think that has only become more true to me like and I think that you know you the value is in like the value of an English literature degree to me is the same value that you get from reading which is that the world up, opens up to you in different ways where you get to inhabit the personhood of somebody that you might have never met in real life and what that does for you I mean you know I know the old Martha Nussbaum like empathy thing is I think a little overplayed and perhaps you know we've overvalued like empathy as an abstract concept but I do think that that value as a person and as someone who perceives and acts in the world is is stand is stands alone from whatever market value of the job you get after this. And you can always say fuck it to your English education and get a job that has nothing to do with it and continue to pursue those passions, you know, on, on a parallel track to a day job that might not, you know, engage your interest in whatever specific period of literature that, you know, it's, I think it is rare that you get to, like, I, I feel like I've realized it is exceedingly rare to get to 
involve your intellectual passions in your day job and it's entirely unnecessary, you know, um, and the value exists in and of itself. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an end in itself, like all of the good things are. And I think that, um, and I think that, you know, <laughs> the, the only, the, the question of how one can be a good writer and human in the hellish age of the internet and like capitalism, the good writer question, I have no idea. It's the only advice I have there is like, you know, I mean, both things, both actually, both projects are continually trying to scrub out your own bullshit, continually trying to identify and purge yourself of bullshit and continually trying to push yourself towards visions of the world and your reality that don't exist yet. Kind of, they're both involved looking a little bit beyond the world as it's presented to you. Um, and just continually reevaluating and continually shifting and adjusting. And I think that's like the work of an entire life in either writing or being alive. So I'm gonna disagree with Gia a little bit on the first question, which is that I actually think that the value of an English degree is that it teaches you how to think and how to approach a problem and how to structure a framework and how to recognize patterns and how to um, analyze unstructured data. And I mean, things that are tremendously valued by the knowledge economy, once you get to a certain level, you may need a second degree. I went back and I, I had a very, like, I think, you know, kind of like you're saying, Gia, I had a very hard time finding a job that, you know, required me to use my brain in the way that I would want to until I got my MBA, ironically. And one of the interesting things I've found about working in consulting is how actually sympathetic it is as a day job with writing the this I got a I, I, I tweeted about this because I thought it was so funny but um I had a like I was invited to a corporate seminar um to teach me how to be a compelling and relentless storyteller <laughs> and I I laughed a little bit but like this is storytelling narrative development at least in the you know in the industry I work I think that there is literally no better training if to becoming a good management consultant than reading Ulysses I stand by it I wish we hired more English majors and we do hire some at you know the company I work for thankfully they hired me <laughs> but um to you know to the second question around being a writer and being it's kind of like we boil it down being a writer and being a good person I, I think that one of the challenges that I've noticed in the current landscape is the idea that these two things should come from the same place or, or, that, or that being a good person should be reflected in the writing. And I actually think that that's often counterproductive to a you know progressive political agenda, which I am extremely extremely deeply in support of. And that, you know, sometimes we, you know, we, we conflate the Otessa Mashfe had a, had a, you know, a great quote about this in book forum recently that it's, it's not, you know, American psycho and Lolita that like we're struggling against as a society. Like we need these dark and stormy books about horrible people. Like that just, that, that if anything, that like helps, you know, uh, you know, a, a diverse and thriving intellectual culture um, that is, that is hopefully progressive. But, um, you know, so I think that sometimes we can conflate like good literature where all the characters are, are good and, you know, show good morals with actual social change and policy change in a way that they, you know, they really don't um, relate. I mean, I think that, for example, the the literary community. I'm new to. I'm very new to the literary community. But from what I've seen so far, it's extraordinarily, you know, politically, um, you know, enlightened and progressive. And just because that's the case doesn't mean that our political landscape is at all. We're like this close to dictatorship over here. So these two things can exist at the same time. And I think that when we conflate them, it actually does a huge disservice to both. I am overawed by the response to that question that is 
very wide open and challenging and you both just like snapped to these incredible uh, nuanced responses. Uh, and I think that's a fitting note to end on. Um, I'm just sorry. I'm just still trying to digest all that you've said. And so I'm like a little bit unable to just do my normal, like, okay, thanks. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> um, but Natasha Joukowsky, Gio Tolentino, thank you so much for joining us uh, on At Home with Literati tonight. Um, Gia, it's great to see you. I hope I can Good see you, you soon. Uh, <laughs> Natasha, we can, hope we can have you in the store. Oh, thank you for and an thank actual you, event thank you so much john to you and literati for having me chia thank you so love much you talk to you soon <laughs> take care everyone and to all of our viewers thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you at the next event have a great night all good night Bye.